So Node has really great HTTP support. I don't know if you guys really appreciate this, but I mean, compared to Ruby or Python, it's pretty phenomenal. Like, I've dealt a lot with the lower level Ruby and Python HTTP stack, and there's so many bugs and oversights, and it's just generally not usually very performant at all. And to put this in perspective, for Node, Node's HTTP support is probably a little bit better than curls right now. Like, there are bugs that we've fixed at this point that we know are open curl bugs that aren't planning on being fixed ever. Um, and we have fixed those in the Node implementation. Um, and Couch only supports HTTP. There is no other format. Uh, it didn't invent its own binary protocol. We want you to be able to talk to it from the browser and all that. So that's a really good fit. Um, especially, like a lot of the problems that we've had with client libraries in Python and Ruby is just that trying to make them really fast and performant. We always hit this bottleneck of HTTP, and that's just never an issue with you new know. Oh, really? OK. Up. Oh. I can, I can probably speak up a bit if we don't even, yeah, because I don't even know where the button is to turn it up, so. <laughs> All right, I'll just speak a little bit louder. <laughs> okay, and concurrency. So yeah, Node is phenomenal at concurrency. It has all this beautiful async I.O. in it. And that's another problem that we've always run into, is that CacheDB is optimized for being incredibly concurrent, because we actually want you to connect to it from the browser, so we've got to handle tons to hundreds of thousands of concurrent connections all the time. That's how we've always optimized from the beginning. But then people plug in their traditional <laughs> Python or Ruby stack, and usually when they talk to a database, they try to limit the number of connections that they do, and they're not very good at concurrency themselves, and that's just never an issue in Node. It's, it's always very, very fast and very beautiful. And a lot of other databases aren't optimized for concurrent access either, and Node's whole system is optimized for concurrent access. So that's really good. Sometimes when you take two things that are both really, really awesome, and you put them together, you get something even more awesome. And you didn't even realize how great it could be. Kind of like if you took curry and like wieners and like, you know, delicious sausages and put them together, you'd have something you didn't even know could blow your mind like this. <laughs> All right. So there's a lot of libraries. One of the things about Node's support for HTTP being so good and uh, the HTTP API and Couch being pretty simple is that anybody can write their own library all the time. So of course we have a bunch. Um, I think we're probably averaging about one a month right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I, I'd love to be able to tell you that like, well, this library is really great at this thing, and this one is really great for this other use case. And they all have their own little features and their niches, and they're definitely very opinionated. But the biggest difference between them is just who wrote them. So, <laughs> so basically, if you like one of these programmers, uh, or you want to talk to them about their library, because like half of them are here, uh, I would just do that. Because there really isn't like a feature graph that you can put up there. They're all pretty comparable. Um, and I put their pictures up there so you can find them. I don't know if Cloudhead's here, but he didn't have a picture, so I just grabbed Cloud from Final Fantasy and put him up there. Um, and uh, I also, that's not a super close end picture of Felix, so I found a bigger one. Um, so yeah, just look for him, and you'll know where you are. OK, so <laughs> the, the other thing about, oh god, that line's in the wrong place. I saw my slides. Uh, basically, Keynote crashed, and I lost all my slides, and so I had to redo them. And so some of them are kind of fucked up. I'm sorry. So this here is using my uh, high-level request library. It's just a little bit simpler than Node's regular HTTP stuff. Um, and this, hopefully, actually, is going to go into core. I sent out the email today. So hopefully, we'll get something like this into Node core, and it'll be a little bit easier to do get and post requests with just one or two lines. But anyway, um, this is how you would talk to CouchDB without a library. Um, the CouchDB API itself is very well defined. It's very simple. It's all HTTP. Um, this is how me and a lot of other people access Couch, and we don't try to go through an abstraction or a library, just because sometimes those abstractions leak, or we need to get new features into them, or, you know, whatever. Um, we know that the HTTP support in Node has everything that we're ever going to need, and we know the Couch API well enough. Um, and if you just want to learn the Couch API and go through the wiki and just look at the raw HTTP API, it's really not very hard at all. It's not like you were trying to write a driver for MySQL or something. Um, so yeah, that's where we use that. Pretend that line down there is in a further slide, like, in the future. Um, <laughs> OK. So couch apps. Does, do people here kind of know the idea behind couch apps at all? So like four. OK. 
Oh, there's more, there's more. OK, all right, cool. So the idea of Couch Apps is that um, rather than having like this middle layer between the browser and the database, you can embed, especially for simpler applications, you can embed pretty much all of the application logic in the CouchDB into the database. And then you don't have a lot of extra round trips. CouchDB is very good at concurrency, blah, blah, blah. Also, these applications now repli can replicate around. So if you have a mobile phone and you want to talk to your application offline and then come back up, you can replicate. When it gets back online, it can replicate with some cloud server. And then the application and the data get synced around. So yeah, that's the idea behind Couch Apps. But here's the problem with Couch Apps. Uh, the only tool right now, well, there's a couple tools. But the main tool is this Python tool called Couch Apps that Benoit wrote. He did a great job. Not knocking it. Um, <laughs> but because the tool is in Python, because I don't think Node really existed when Benoit started this, um, you, we had to kind of map the little JS functions and little attributes that end up going into this design document. It's all just one big JSON document at some point um, that gets run in like a JavaScript view server. So all these little JavaScript files are everywhere in the file system because with the tool being in Python, it's not like you could just write some literals or you know, scope out an object and then just kind of dynamically be like, I want this piece here and that piece there. So what you end up with is a directory structure kind of like this. And you can see a lot of things that make this hard to use. Like, I mean, for one, there's just a ton of different directories everywhere. Like, I mean, if you didn't think that Java had enough directories and little files in it, then like, you're going to love this. Um, it's awesome. And, and the best part is that like, you'll have a directory of eight files for like, your views, and they'll all have a map.js. So once they're open in little tabs, there's no way to tell them apart unless you click back on them in the directory tree. Um, so you'll be editing one of your maps, and then you're like, oh, wait, shit, that's the wrong map. And there wasn't really a lot to tell me about that. Um, so yeah, that's some of the pains that you go through working with that. So to try and, make the, try and decrease that pain a little bit, um, I wrote a node thing. Uh, it's a new API and a new sync script that doesn't use this directory structure, but gives you an alternate way to define couch apps. Because couch apps are just design documents with a bunch of application code in them. They're basically just a big JSON thing with some you know, functions in them. So this is kind of the simplest case right here. This is, this is actually a SAMI application that I wrote um, to do graphing for performance analysis of CouchDB. It's a, it's a pretty cool app, and we do really pretty graphs with it. But um, it doesn't require anything fancy on the couch end, because all it really is is a SAMI script. I just want to like do some rewrites to map it to slash and map the database to the API, and then map everything else, uh, all of the attachments, like CSS and uh, all my different JavaScript files that are attachments. I just want to scope them to the design document itself. So I have these couple rewrite rules in there, and then I have um, a thing that just loads the attachments from a directory. And then all of those attachments now will go into the design document. And then if we go back a few slides, so pretend that that line right there is at the bottom of the other slide. This is the script that you use to sync that application to CouchDB. And the nice thing is that after it syncs, it'll actually stay open and use Node's file watchers to take any changes that happen on that and push it up to the database. So one of the things that we've been trying to do for a really long time is make Couch App development as easy as developing a local application. Like if you were just going to pull up a directory of CSS and JavaScript and hack on that, and like it's so fast and so nice to do. Like I, I pull up TextMate and I have it actually save on application switch. So I just command tab back to the browser and refresh, and it's really easy to do development. And trying to do that with, with CouchDB, there's like all these layers in between, and keeping that fast is kind of hard. When I was developing this app, I left that node sync script running for three days and completely forgot that it was there and that I was developing against a remote server. I would just like command tab back and forth from my editor to, to the browser, and it would always be updated with the changed code. And I also, I mean, I left it running for three days between laptop open and closes, and I didn't even notice the process running. It didn't leak any memory or anything. Like, if that was a Python process, it would have just decided to eat a whole core for no reason. Um, like, that's kind of a testament to how awesome a lot of the Node file watcher stuff is right now. And we're still improving it, so that's also good. Um, yeah, so that stuff is just awesome. For more complicated applications, um, you can do a lot more stuff with this script. So you can load up common JS modules, and then you can also load them as files as attachments. Um, that's really cool because a lot of these common JS modules we can share between the server and the client. And um, like the, 
inside of CouchDB in underscore utils, there's a jQuery couch API, and that includes a require in it. So you can just tell it what design document to go after, and you can load all the common JS modules that you use in the view server. Um, yeah, so I can just start adding arbitrary attributes to the design document, which is really nice instead of showing list functions and stuff. Um, here you see the, the rewrites all over again. Um, let me go to the next page. So here's how you would do, add your map reduces. You can, like this is so much easier. That used to be uh, two directories and a single small JavaScript file with three lines in it. And now it's just inline. Um, the only thing here is that it's, it's kind of fake, it's kind of a trick. Like you can't reference a closure from the, from the base of this module inside of this function because what's gonna happen is it's gonna get too stringed and then loaded in a totally different context in the view server. So it's really just a convenience for definition. It's, it's not like this whole thing gets loaded in and interpreted like this at any other time other than when we import it into Node and convert it into a design document. Um, what else we got? We got uh, an update function. Um, no, no, sorry, that's a show function. Show functions are really nice. So one, one of the problems that, that you have, like if, you, if all of your app code is a SAMI app, then it can't really be indexed by Google because that's just one page with like, you know, totally different content variations at the end. So the show function is just a CatchB function that um, inside of the URL will take a single document ID and then it'll pass that document to this function. And you can do stuff like grab some mustache templates and return HTML. You can also, you, if you wanted to return an RSS feed, you could do that. For RSS feeds, actually, you should probably use a list function. So a list function is, is similar to a show function, but what you do is you tell it what view you want to hit and what query you want to do against that view. And then row by row, you can um, iteratively go over that entire query and return uh, an HTML page for that. So that would be really good for like an RSS feed. So you would just do a rewriter that defaulted to you know, limit 10 and you get the last 10 articles um, for you know, some timestamp. Um, and then you would just pass that into this list function and then you would return some XML. You can change all the headers and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty simple. Um, there are a couple performance problems with this right now, but we're working on it. Okay, on to the next cool thing. I'm realizing how short this is gonna be at this point because this is like the last thing that I'm gonna talk about. Um, so usually when people go like, hey, I wanna use Node and CouchDB, uh, this is what they wanna do. They, they basically wanna you know, slot Node into where they used to have Python or Ruby or something like if they're really unlucky, Java. Um, and then, you know, they want to put Couch behind it like they used to with their old database. Um, and one of the reasons that people always did that with their old databases, their old databases didn't talk HTTP. You know, that was their only option was to put it behind something that could take HTTP requests and then talk to the database. So this is what we've been using a little bit lately because there's some stuff that you just can't do inside of the CouchDB view server. Like, inside of those show and list functions, you can't just go and, like, send an email or go and like request some remote content from a site, like you're in a sandbox. One of the reasons that you're in a sandbox is because we want you to be able to replicate applications from different people that are essentially untrusted. Like, they're gonna be locked into that database and only have access to that database. They're not gonna be able to get at your personal information and blah, blah, blah. Um, because of the way that vhost and rewriter stuff works, they're totally locked into all their session information, only being able to access that. And then in the view server, we also lock it down. So you can really just install applications into your CouchDB and not worry about them, like you don't worry about visiting websites. Um, so yeah, but because there are some deficiencies, we started working on this. Um, and there's a couple different permutations of, of this paradigm right here, like Chris has one, and, and I've been working on this, and I think somebody else won't run as well. Um, I'm gonna talk about mine a little bit, because the idea is a little bit further along. Um, so CouchDB has this awesome, awesome feature called underscore changes. So you do an HTTP request to underscore changes, and you get the sequence index for the database, which is essentially every document in the database right now has like um, a, a sequence where it was last updated or deleted or whatever inside of the database. So you can literally reconstruct the entire database by hitting this changes feed. But you can also use long pull against it um, with the last sequence ID that you had. You can also do a continuous feed. So in Node, and uh, if you really hack up the Firefox SHR object, you can do this as well. Um, you can get a real-time feed um, of this entire API. And we'll have WebSocket support as soon as we get it into Mochi Web. So basically, you can get push notifications to the browser or to whatever code that you're writing in real time from the database. It's very, very nice. Um, 
And of course, Node can talk to this as well, and it's even better at parsing it. So this thing that we've been working on is Node, uh, one Node process sits on the changes feed for every database. And it's also checking all the time to see if there's been any new databases created. When it gets a design document added with a changes attribute, um, it actually takes that, this whatever code is uh, in this string here, and it evals it in a new Node.js process. The reason that we forked that into its own process is so that um, when you update it again, we can just leave that one around for a little bit and let it clear out and then start a new process and start having that handle the new changes that come in. So we'll get into why this is useful. The reason that we want you to update an attribute in the design document in order to flush that is because now updating this external process handler um, is the same process that you go through for updating your application normally. So like the distribution, uh, like there, there are no like push tools, uh, like you know, get push, do something, and then you restart your couch app. It's all just replication. So you just put this document in for all of your other application code. Why wouldn't you want to do that for your Node.js external process? Okay. So this is what it would look like to send an email. Um, rather than talking to some HTTP service and then like basically blocking until that says, oh, I sent this email, and then if for some reason the socket crashes or like anything bad happens during that time, you don't know if you already sent it, so now you've got to try to figure out if you sent it or just send it again and then you'd have duplicate emails. Um, we just share, we just have a state machine that's shared between everybody involved in this transaction. So what happens is the, the browser application will just go, hey, I want to send a new email, and it'll set it with a uh, draft status. And then the node process will go, okay, that change happened to this database, I have an external process handler for that database. Um, it'll send it that change with the, with the whole document in it. So it'll get like the sequence ID and the new rev and a bunch of other information. And then what Node.js will do is it'll update that document in CouchDB and say, okay, I'm gonna go try to send that now. And maybe it'll also put a timestamp in there so that we can clean them up if for some reason it crashes. Um, and then it'll go off and send that email because Node can go and send emails, it can talk to whatever, it's not inside of the same sandbox that all of the CouchDB stuff is in. And then it comes back and it goes, oh, that was sent. And then it updates the CouchDB database with, with that information. So the browser could just be sitting on the changes feed as well for the database or just for this document and in real time update the status of that, of what's going on behind the scenes here. So the, the real big win that you get with this is that this whole system, this whole application now works offline. So when I've got like a CouchDB on my Android phone and a CouchDB on my desktop and I get on a plane or I'm in San Francisco, uh, so I clearly don't have any service, um, I, I can go into my email client and just be like, I want to send some emails. I'll set them in the draft because you're not online yet. And replication isn't like some kind of special protocol with CouchDB. Replication uses the normal CouchDB API. So um, another CouchDB replicating a document to, to the Cloud Couch creates the same document in the same sequence index and all of that stuff as a normal put would do. Um, so by the time that that all makes it back to the cl Cloud Couch DB, uh, the Node.js process will go, oh, I have a bunch of emails to send. So when it's online, that replication is all happening in real time, it's all continuous, you wouldn't even notice that there's like this extra link in that chain. Um, but then when it goes offline, none of your app code has to deal with being offline. That's all gonna be handled by CouchDB. All you're gonna do is go send this email and it's gonna go, well, that's still in draft status and nobody's trying to send it. Um, but it doesn't have to lock up like Gmail does right now for me for some reason. And then when you add in all these other crazy CouchDBs, like, you know, you're probably not gonna have this yourself. But in a lot of work groups, you're gonna have a bunch of CouchDBs in different, like, mobile phones and maybe in different data centers, and you're gonna be trying to, like, you know, sync everybody's data across, like, Korea to here and blah, blah, blah. And they're all gonna have these, like, super weird replication paradigms where one of them's gonna be doing one-way replication, one's gonna be doing two-way, and da-da-da. If you've only got one guy responsible for handling the email, then you're not gonna have a bunch of duplicate emails sent. And because that document is just a state machine, if one of them updates it and says, I'm sending it, the other one's not gonna go and try to send it as well. Like, that's, that's gonna get replicated around, and it's gonna go, oh, no, no, I, didn't, I don't try to send that yet. Um, so yeah, now you can have these, like, federated, distributed applications, um, and they can also go off and talk to the internet, and they're not necessarily in a sandbox, except for the one trusted CloudCouchDB, or maybe I run another one that I want or whatever. You can do whatever you want. Um, 
<laughs> but it doesn't require any new app code. I didn't have to write a bunch of JavaScript to try and handle all these weird edge cases with replication. That all just works. Couch is very good at replication. Um, so yeah, I had another slide that had links to everything, and I forgot to rewrite that one, so I'm very sorry about that. Um, but these are all on GitHub. Um, uh, one is uh, GitHub, the node couch app stuff is GitHub slash Michael, my name spelled fucked up, slash node.couchapp.js. Um, and the other one is just in node.couch.js. Um, and in there you'll see that there's a, we call it a generic changes consumer. It's very inside baseball. Should probably come up with a new name for that. Um, yeah, so any questions? No. I find it very hard to believe that everybody actually understands what I just talked about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, amen. So how do you work with the how do you work with the mobile couch? Okay. Yeah, yeah, so we have a, we have a beta up right now with, for the Android SDK. Um, other ones are coming. I don't know if I can talk about them. I know it's public that we're working on the iOS one. I just can't tell you how far along it is. But um, anyway, uh, so yeah, when you're, when you're talking to Android Couch, uh, Android Couch is, Android is pretty cool. So with Android, what you can do is uh, if you wanted to write like a phone gap application, right? Um, and you wanted to distribute the entire CouchDB around with your application and bind it to it, you can build it that way. Um, but what you can also do is you can build CouchDB as a service, um, so then it's installed once for the device, and when other applications are installed, what they ask for is access to that service, um, and you'll see like a little couch icon when you install it and stuff, and then, um, and then they would just get access to the local system CouchDB. So we're trying to figure out which one of those is gonna work the best. Um, in terms of like just accessing CouchDB, I mean, it's still just the HTTP API. You still just write HTML5 applications against CouchDB. Um, that doesn't change on mobile at all. Um, I mean, we're definitely going to do some really good like phone gap integrations so that we can get at some of the native stuff even inside of that HTML5 application. But now when you develop it against CouchDB and you store the data in CouchDB, the offline stuff works and it can replicate back up. And it can replicate with your desktop computer while you're offline on a plane or whatever as well. Um, that stuff all works quite well. Yeah. Yeah, you can go to the Couch One website. So it's couchone.com, and then you'll see a big thing about mobile, and you can download that, download the Android SDK. Um, and there's some good preliminary documentation for that. Um, I don't know if he did it this week or if he's doing it next week, but um, Aaron Miller, the guy who wrote the Android port, is doing uh, some kind of free webcast for O'Reilly um, about how to do development with it. Yeah. Also, I know that Brian LaRue has been messing with it, and Joe McCann's been messing with it, so you can bug them about it. <laughs> uh, anything else? Where, that way? Yes. So you showed the, the about the sort of the text text mm -hmm. uh, in the screen. The one thing people used to put in the screen layer is like access console and security. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's not all completely open. Like, no, no. There, there's security in CouchDB. We weren't just like, eh, no, we don't need that. Um, yeah. So CouchDB has a user's database, and um, every database, what ends up happening is after that auth happens, then we just have the user document from the user's database. And we pass that around as the context for that user. So there's like a nice abstraction between those layers. Um, whenever a document update happens, like we take that user context, and we take the old document and the new document, and even when documents are deleted, it's just now a deleted attribute. Um, we pass those as three variables to a JavaScript function, and what you can do is you can throw. You can just say like, I'm not, no, that user is not allowed to do that. And that throw message gets turned into like a proper HTTP 400 um, re response to the client. Um, the really cool thing about that is that because replication is just a normal client, like on my Android cache DB, I'm like root. Like I can do whatever the fuck I want. Um, and then when I go off and I replicate with the cloud cache DB, like I'm not root. <laughs> I'm actually like a user on that couch and I'm talking to the regular HTTP API and I authenticate. And if I'm not allowed to write the documents that I wrote on my local couch, like those will all be like, no, 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 that's not happening. Um, and I won't like pollute everybody else's data. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, I could probably do an entire talk just about all the authentication things that you can do with CacheDB. We're also, we're working on uh, some new documentation that'll show cert how you would implement certain uh, authentication patterns in Couch. Um, but yeah, one of the nice things about it, and a couple people in our case studies have actually um, shown that this is how they use Couch and how they use, um, how they push data around and give data to customers is that they just, they, every customer gets their own database. And if any information is ever like exchanged between customers, like they control those access controls of what's going in and out. And so everybody at the end of the day gets a database that they can do with whatever they want and they can replicate that with somebody else. Or they can keep pulling and replicating and things like that. It's kind of hard to explain without slides, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, anything else? Yes? Oh, yeah, well, so the, the, but by the time that the SDK is not in beta, it will actually come with a demo application. Um, and to make sure that we can get through the store in Android and the store in iPhone, we'll actually be taking that application, which all the, you'll see, be able to see all the code for, and submitting it through the App Store to make sure that like, there's no problems. Okay. So yeah. So yeah, there, there will be a demo application uh, soon, basically. There's lots of demo couch apps for uh, desktop. Though. Um, basically, the, the idea is that anybody can write an application and stick it into this, and it's kind of like the, the open app store for couch apps. And um, when you look at any application, you can see like a little demo, and then you can actually replicate it to your couch DB. Um, and then you've got all the code and all the example stuff, and it's pretty cool. What? Can you sell it? No, no, we have not hooked that up yet. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe someday, but not yet. I mean, you could sell a couch app through the Android store. <laughs> yep. Dump it to the computer? What do you mean? Like, like dump how? Like, I mean. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're all in one, like a couch app is literally one design document that says everything about that application. So, I mean, you can pull that whole thing around. That's what replication does. Replication just pulls the whole document around. Yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Nothing else? I'm pretty sure that now I'm actually pushing out of time. So, let's get Felix up here. All right, cool.